Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Dashian Miller here from Warrior Concepts with this week's episode of Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. Okay, I almost sounded like uh, Captain Kirk there for a second. Anyway, for those of you old enough to know who the hell I'm talking about. Anyway, all right, so uh, during this week's episode of Whiteboard Wednesday, we're going to be covering gun defense, which is an aspect of right self-defense, right? But specifically, we're going to take a look at two uh, aspects of gun defense that go virtually un- covered, right, uh, in, in the entire realm, right, um, especially for people who train, even, even with people who train uh, in this direction, okay? So both of these, both of these things we're going to be covering while involving self-defense uh, or a self-defense situation with firearms, uh, they require more than shooting skills, okay? They, were more, they require more uh, than how uh, good you might be with hitting a target with a bullet, okay? So, I mean, let me tell you a story before we get started here, okay? Um, this happens a lot, right? But uh, one that really sticks out because this guy had like a lot of training. Um, I, I did a, a gun defense seminar a bunch of years ago. And so day one, right, we were doing uh, shooting skills, right? Day two, we were covering both of these topics I'm going to talk about today, okay? Um, but um, so we get to the end of the training, right? And he had only signed up for day one, right? Now, this guy had trained with... Uh, multiple police uh, uh, training courses. He had trained with some really high name, right? Uh, uh, trainers, right? He had even trained with Israeli special forces and and some folks in like German special police and, and all that kind of stuff, right? This guy was a crack shot with a handgun, right? Again, I'm going to stick to handguns today just because it's, it's too difficult to just keep throwing around different weapons and whatnot. So we'll stick to one. And then some other time we'll take a look at how this would cross over to rifle, shotgun, long arm kind of stuff. Right. But anyway, uh, he had, he'd done a lot of, a lot of training. Okay. And we get to the end of the day and I said, you know, there's spots open in the training for tomorrow. Right. Um, you know, are you interested? He said, I really don't need that. I mean, I've got this, right. Um, I'm not going to, and so I'm going to share with you in a little bit a point that I made, right? A, I'm, going to, I'm going to paint a picture of a scenario, right? And when I painted that, like his eyes gla glazed over. He looked at me and said, in all the time that I've trained, in all these courses that I've gone to, everyone's always focused on getting the weapon out, trained on the bad guy, pulling the trigger, hitting the target, and they never, ever discussed this aspect or part of what I'm going to talk about is that possible scenario. So, yeah, I'll be here tomorrow. Okay. So, anyway, right. So, let's do this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. We got a whole other video on this on this one aspect, but I want to go through this very very quickly so we can see the the range right of of skill sets that are necessary if we're going to be employing a firearm for self defense. Right now, if you're just out like plinking cans, hunting, whatever, you do you do you. Okay, um, there are some general safety conditions and things like that. But if we're looking at how to not die at the hands of somebody who has one there's incoming fire or the potential for it and all that kind of stuff, then there's other shit we need to do. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to lay out the four, what I call the four pillars. These are four areas of training that anybody who goes through my, my systems and my training has to be versed at, or at least know about so they can pick and choose what they're going to do. Right. I don't put these things up here because I think they're optional. I put these things up here so people can see that if they pick options, they better be, picking it to focus on something to get better at it, or they're putting their lives in their hands because they've chosen to not look at a certain area. Okay. So I use this four pillars uh, framework a lot, and it depends on the weapon. It depends on whether we're doing unarmed or whatever, but in this case, right. And again, I'm with the exception of number one, right. The numbers are arbitrary, right. Don't worry about it so much. Okay. But the reason I call these pillars, again, very, very quickly, is if you can imagine like a gazebo or the Parthenon in Greece or something like that, right? This structure, right? Okay. There are these pillars, right? At the corners, right? If you're from down south or whatever, you might call them posts, right? Well, I don't care what you call them, okay? So if we looked at from the top down, right? So here's the roof, 
Okay, there's the peak, right? And then we've got these pillars at least at the four corners, right? If you know what I'm talking about with the Parthenon or the, the Parthenon in Greece, right? There's how many, right? Holding this thing up, okay? So here's the idea with the pillar principle, right? If I have all four of these things, if I have more, even better, right? There's, there's more structure and whatnot, right? But I'm covering the four points and it can withstand pressure. It can withstand a storm, right? And remain standing. That storm would have to be hellacious for this thing to break, right? But what if I'm missing one? Okay. Can still stand as long as nothing comes in a certain direction where that pillar is necessary for support. Everything should be okay. Right. If something comes along and I need that and I don't have it, well, shit falls down. Okay. What happens if I'm missing more than one? What happens if I only have one? Okay. So you get the idea, right? And if we can think about how this goes together, whether we're talking about armed, unarmed, it doesn't really matter, right? There are certain things that you need in place so that the system will hold up under greater and greater levels of pressure, okay? All right, so pillar number one, again, this is the only, this is the only one that I would always put at number one, right? So this is familiarization, okay? Familiarization, right? Now, familiarization covers everything from knowing how the weapon works, knowing how to break it down, put it back together again, all that kind of stuff, to grips, to posture, neutralizing recoil. When Well, actually, that kind of crosses over, but uh, grips and all that kind of stuff. And then that kind of feeds into, right? So in this case, right, pillar two is shooting. Now, remember, I'm talking about self-defense, right? Because anybody can do this and then go out and shoot and hit a target. And, you know, if it's a paper target, it's not shooting back right? And the holes in a target or you're shooting at a deer or whatever, it's not shooting back. Your only pressure is, am I going to have a heart attack because I went humping through the woods and I don't exercise all year long? Or the deer hears me and takes off, right? Or I wing it and it's bleeding out, but I need to track it for five miles and then drag it back off the mountain, okay? So in this case, right, uh, everything from drawing the weapon, getting the muzzle on, uh, sighting with the sights, instinctive sighting, which is not using the sights, right? Uh, the importance of my grip and posture, which I've learned up here, right? But the importance of grip and posture to neutralize a recoil, the three different types of recoil, all that kind of stuff, right? The idea is shot group, making sure that all my shots count. I'm not doing uh, uh, prey and spray, all that kind of crap, right? Okay, so I'm my own eraser today, okay? Number three, right? Retention. Retention skills. Retention is how to hold on to the damn thing when somebody else is trying to take it away from me. Okay. And number four is disarms. How do I take away one that is pointing at me? Right. Typically, I'm in an unarmed situation here, but we're going to talk about a situation today where you're absolutely armed. Right. You have a weapon. Okay, but why the hell would you still need these? Right? I have a weapon. Why the hell would I still need these? Right. So this is the focus of today's training. Okay. Retention and disarm skills. All right. If you came here for shooting, go find another YouTube video. Okay. Or come back some other time. I definitely need an eraser. I had it over here and then moved it. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. The air is dry and my allergies are kicking up. Okay, so question, right? What do you do if you're armed, right? You're you're armed with a firearm, okay? And again, later on, we could take a look at the same thing from a knife defense perspective. You've got one, right? But, okay, so you're armed with a firearm and either one or the other of these conditions exist. One, here's someone else tries to take your weapon away from you. And in today's uh, episode, we're going to take a look at three conditions that minimum we should be training for. And I think most things fall into these three, okay? Or two, right? You're armed, but your weapon is holstered and you walk right into a situation. You turn a corner, whatever. There's an assailant, he's armed, his weapon is already out and it's already pointed at you, okay? Yours is here, holstered, his is already in your face. 
It takes him this long to engage you. It takes you how long to get that out. Okay. You get the idea, right? So what do you do? Okay. So these are just two very common scenarios, right? Um, they're not only not covered, okay, but also that most people never think of, okay? And a lot of people, I, I just watched my numbers on here just drop significantly because a lot of people don't even want to think about these things, right? Because they're going to be so fast that it's not going to happen. It's kind of like the the one video I have uh, that's a, a defense against a, a karate roundhouse kick, right? Oh, the number of views and a number of comments, right? Because that's how you get kicked in the head because people assume that they're going to be able to change course on a dime. They're going to be able to be faster than somebody who's already out in front of them, right? Okay. You didn't have to like algebra in, in school and understand negative numbers to understand that you're below zero and need to get to at least neutral, right? Where you're on even footing with this guy to even begin to take an advantage, okay? So we have to think about how we're going to approach these scenarios, okay? All right, so uh, so here's this problem, right? Most people don't even think about this, right? And if they do, it's a quick fix, right? Just like women, most women tend to think that groin kicking, right, is the beginning and ending for women's self-defense, right? You, you ask most women who have, have are not in a, in a self-defense course, have never taken one or whatever, right? Okay, you ever think about taking self-protection? Why? That's what my boyfriend, my husband's for, whatever, or I'll just kick him in the groin. Okay. When we guys know that it better be a good one, because if not, you now have somebody that's not just trying to attack you, but freaking enraged. Right. Okay. But just like women tend to stop, start and stop there. Right. Most people that lean toward, right. Having a firearm, second amendment training, that kind of stuff, right. Knowing the danger exists and this is how they're going to deal with it tend to start and stop with shooting skills, drawing and shooting skills. Okay. And then they find themselves in a situation that they never planned on, they never prepared for, and they can't get out of, okay? Um, there's there's actually another self-defense, uh, like a uh, firearms uh, instructor. He's got a bunch of stuff online and stuff. Maybe you know him. I, I'm not going to throw out names and stuff at the moment. But uh, he likes to say, if you can't stop 10 guys, right, if you can't keep 10 guys out of your ass in a prison shower, you don't need another gun course, okay? And this points to very, something very, very important, and that's at the crux of what we're going to be talking about today, right? Okay, so let's take a look at these two topics, right? Gun disarms and firearm retention one at a time, all right? And as you're going to see for both, you're going to need self-defense skills that have nothing to do with shooting, but they have everything to do with gun defense, right? Because in our realm, okay, we don't just need to protect ourselves. Part of protecting ourselves is also the need for protecting the weapon. Okay. So let's do that first. All right. We're, at the end, we'll take a look at how both of these are connected, both in training and in the real world. Right. Um, but for now, let's start where I actually believe it's easier. Okay. Not necessarily the, the defense part. Right. But you're actually ahead in the game. Okay. And that is retention. Right? Holding on to your weapon. Okay. So the reason why I said this is better is you're at a better place, right? You're closer to where most people want to be in a self-defense situation when they start thinking about carrying, carrying a firearm, right? Well, for the most part anyway, right? So, and that's where the weapon is either out or at least available, right? It's out or at least available. Okay. You have time, you have availability, that kind of thing. You're either carrying it or it's already out or coming out when you need to keep the weapon in your hand so that he doesn't take it and use it against you or take it and then he uses his to shoot you in the face. Okay. All right. There are three conditions or setups for our training. I'll give you some examples after I, after I lay these things out. Okay. There's three conditions. Okay. The first one is that the gun uh, is in your holster, right? The gun is holstered. Okay? It's, it's still here, okay? And somebody steps in to try to take it, 
Okay, they go for the gun on your hip, right? If you're law enforcement or whatever, this is one of the big fears that 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 we all had. Okay. And there's been great strides in trying to make sure that this is harder and harder for an assailant to do. Um, one of my students is a, is a Pennsylvania State Trooper, and she was describing these holsters and how there's an extra latch or two that she engages to get the weapon out, right, that are very difficult, if not impossible, for an assailant coming from the outside to get at, right, to be able to get this weapon out. The problem with that is the same thing with a, with a weapon that has multiple safeties on it, Okay. The more things you need to engage or disengage to get the weapon into an operable position, right? The more, the, the more you're stacking the odds against you. And under pressure, okay? So it's one thing to try to put pressure out on the range or the drills that you're using to create that kind of pressure, right? But unless you're in a full adrenal response, limited to gross motor skills, which is what's going to happen, right? You're not going to be doing fine motor skill stuff, right? Or you've trained like an inordinate amount of time, right? Hours and hours and hours, right? To where you can just do that kind of thing, right? Like finding your brake pedal from the accelerator when you need to brake, okay? If you can't and you need to think about it, you could die with the gun still in your holster, okay? All right, so condition one, and again, these are in no particular order, but condition one is the gun is holstered, okay? And you need to keep it. You need to keep a hold of it, okay? Condition number two is that the gun is out, Right, and your assailant attacks the gun. Okay, why'd you shoot him? Right. Okay, so he grabs it, moves it out of the way, and again, at the end of this, when we start to tie all this stuff together, you're going to understand why. When you learn one of these realms, you start to recognize why you better learn the other side because they're mirror opposites of each other. Okay. So the gun is out and the assailant attacks, right? He moves the gun out of the way or while you're drawing, he reaches down and jams it up and the muzzle's pointing at the ground. That gun is ineffective if you can't hit him with it and you can't shoot him with it, okay? It's just an impediment, right? And you need to hold on to it because you know what happens if you let go, okay? Or he strips it out, right? So condition one, gun's holstered. He goes for it while you're here and you need to keep it. Two, gun's already out. He attacks the weapon itself to keep the muzzle off hit offline with him or whatever, right? Trying to jam things up so that you can't get it on him, okay? And condition three is that your weapon is attacked by a third party, okay? Your weapons, you're, you've got your weapon trained on this guy, right? Like my gun, right? Weapon's trained on this guy, right? And somebody, I don't care, good Samaritan, his Confederate, whatever, comes off from a side or whatever, you could be anywhere from drawing, right? Going for the weapon, drawing or training it, right? And he attacks the weapon. And now you need to handle this guy while maintaining control of that guy, especially if he has a weapon, okay? These are three different conditions, okay? And again, pointing out uh, just a couple of examples, right? So here's this, right? Dealing with this guy, either he's going for a weapon, or uh, I'm just I'm just moving around, right? Somebody realizes I have it, and they're going to get the jump on me, and they go for the weapon in my holster, and I either need to keep it in there or, right, maintain it while they're trying to steal it from me, okay? Two, guns out. We already talked about that. I've got it on him, or I'm in the process of drawing. He moves in and jams that weapon, or he gets offline and whatnot, okay? We're going to be covering a, a couple of examples, probably not of all these things because we don't have that much time, right? We have 75 to 90 minutes on our Friday class, but Friday virtual class, that's what we're going to be working on, looking at models and, and scenarios for handling these kind of things, okay? And you're going to find that I don't care how good you are with that far, firearm once it's out and how many, what your shot group is like. I don't care if it's a spray and pray. I don't care if it's, you know, you're within the four inch shot groups that I require of my students. I, I don't care. Because if you can't keep the muzzle on the guy or you can't keep the weapon, you can't, you don't retain ownership. None of those things matter. And none of those skills work here. Unless you're just going to, as he's, you know, trying to get the weapon, you're just going to pull the trigger and shoot yourself in the leg so that maybe he takes mercy on you and doesn't kill you outright because you're an idiot, right? And takes your weapon and goes off and commits a crime and shoots somebody else anyway, right? You get the idea, okay? 
So there are three conditions that have to be in our training. Okay. And again, I'm flying through this stuff because we have limited time. Okay. All right. So now I, I, I don't get a chance to see the comments while I'm on this because we've had people hijack things. So I don't leave the comments up where they're running and all that kind of stuff. So I really can't answer anything at the moment. But if you're posting in comments or like if any of these things here was a freaking aha moment, like, holy shit, I never thought of that. OK, or whatever. You can always post it in the comments. If you're on YouTube, you know how to do it over there. If you're on Facebook, whatever. Right. You can always post those. And uh, I will do my best at responding or answering questions or or whatever. Right. But at least, you know, let me know if any of these things was a shit. I never thought of that. OK. Um, moment. OK. All right. So second. Right. Very, very quickly here. All right. Second. All right. Let's move into and take a look at disarms. OK. Disarms. You need to take his weapon away from him. See how these are mirror opposites? One, I'm preventing someone from taking my weapon. The other one is me needing to take somebody else's weapon. Okay? All right? Maybe some of the most intuitive of you are starting to put these things together, but we'll take it take a look at how they're the yin and yang of each other in training. And I don't just mean complementing opposites. Okay, which is where most people stop with yin yang. Well, no, they don't. Most people stop with yin yang being fate or destiny or bullshit like that. And they have no idea because they just listen to everybody else and they don't do their own research or go to somebody who actually freaking knows something. Anyway, all right. So, all right. Disarms, way more difficult, right? In all the scrolls in traditional lineages, right, that have to do with combat, okay? The upper level stuff, okuden, hiden, that kind of stuff, right? Those level scrolls are that they involve what are typically known as muto dori. Muto dori, okay, for those of you who are more classically trained, right? Muto dori. Okay. Muto, mu means without or lacking. To is blade. Okay. And dori is to catch your seeds, right? Muto dori is he's armed and you're not. But it, it, while this is muto without a blade, it's not limited to just swords, right? It could be knife. It could be stick. It could be whatever, right? So the point is he's armed and you're not. This is always upper level stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff you need to learn before you can effectively do this, right? Because again, you screw this up, okay? Well, you may not know it. It may happen that fast that you just don't know it, okay? All right. So again, there's three conditions, Three basic training scenarios. Notice how I didn't say three techniques. It's three basic conditions or scenarios or situations that that where, where this is going. Okay. The first one, right, is okay, the gun's in your face. Now it might not be in your face, it might be at your gut. He might be behind you with it up against your head. He might be shoving it into the small of your back. He might have you in a chokehold right here with a guns against your temple. What I don't care, right? But either way, his weapon is out. Okay. And again, we're looking at here in, in this condition, right? In this one, we can assume that he's armed and we're not. Like we don't have a weapon at all. Okay. But what I really want you to consider is that. You may be armed. Remember, I talked about that with the, pretend, uh, the, the the scenarios earlier, right? You may have a weapon on your hip. You may be carrying a clip knife. You may have a, a sidearm, whatever. But he's got the jump on you. And if you even go for that, all he has to do is twitch his finger a little bit and your kids grow up without a dad. Or mom, in the case may be, if some of you girls are on. Okay? So... Guns in your face. That's condition one. Okay. Condition two is right. Um, disarms. Yeah. Right. Okay. So he's going for his own weapon. Okay. So he's armed and he's going for his weapon and you need to jam that up and take control of that before he can get to it. See how these things are mirror opposites in one of them. Right. My weapon's out. In one, I'm going for my weapon. And another one, somebody's going for my weapon, but I haven't, I, I need to, I need to keep it, right? So in this case, 
He's going for his weapon, and I need to get in there and jam that up. Okay. The third scenario is, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna call this uh, like just self defense. Okay. But what I mean by this is, you know or suspect that he has a weapon on his body, and as a part of dealing with him, moving in on him, uh, ducking his punches or whatever, you disarm him in the process. Okay. And this starts, here's an example of where this starts. This starts with knowing that the average thug may steal or somehow acquire a weapon. But generally speaking, this is statistically, generally speaking, they don't steal the holster, right? So most thugs carry a, a, a handgun in one of two places, okay? Is that is this a forever, you know, guaranteed thing? No, of course not. The greater amount of time, right, is either in a hoodie pocket right here in the front or in a wind jacket or windbreaker jacket or right in the belt line, in the, in the pant, in the waistline, right here. It's just easiest right there, okay? 90%, right, will ca be carrying their weapons right there, okay? So all I need to do is look at how the pockets lay on, on jackets or, or a, a windbreaker or a, a hoodie or something like that, right, or, right, where this thing is, they're wearing shorts and not something like that. And the t-shirts pulled out, right? Think about the modern styles, right? Okay. How does the modern style serve the weapon carrying thug? Nobody thinks anything about somebody walking around in trousers or shorts or whatever with their t-shirt hanging out. Perfectly covers the firearm. There was a day back in this old man's day when if your t-shirt was out, you were an unkempt individual, right? Because everybody tucked their shirts in. You tuck your shirts in, it's really difficult. Somebody has to go out of their way to cover a weapon. Now they need to wear, I mean, and now it could be 110 degrees in August and people are wearing hoodies, okay? If it were summertime and somebody was wearing a hoodie or a jacket or whatever, they had something underneath, whether it was here or, okay? But in today's world, and the more we think that stuff is normal, the more we're going to overlook it and then miss, miss possibilities or probabilities in some cases, okay? All right, so in this case, I know or at least think there's a high probability he's got a weapon, right? And so I need to effectively disarm him uh, so that he can't get at his weapon. See, again, how these are just mirror opposites, right? Just like in, in retention, I've got my weapon out, he attacks. In retention, I'm going for my weapon. He attacks. In uh, retention, right? I'm not going for it yet, but he knows it's there and goes for it, right? You get where this is going, okay? So here's, here's the thing, right? With this one, right? Again, I have to act regardless of whether I'm armed, okay? With all of these, regardless of how whether that or not I'm armed. Because if most people are carrying, got a clip knife on, like I normally do, right? Okay, I go nowhere without at least this. Okay, I don't sleep with it, but you get the idea, right? There's enough things around me in my home. Okay, I have a ninja house. Anyway, um, it doesn't matter if I'm armed. If he has to jump on me, I need to operate like I'm unarmed, and I have to be able to handle an armed attacker from an unarmed -armed position. Again has nothing to do with shooting skills, has nothing to do with anything that most people tend to train with when it comes to using a firearm for self-defense. It has everything to do with unarmed self-defense skills, okay? And I need to operate as though I'm not armed until a condition gets, until I get to a position in that scenario where I can draw mine, including actually disarming him. I take his weapon away, and if I'm carrying, I'm going to draw my weapon. Well, if I take it away from him, why not just turn it on him? Because I know how my weapon works. I know it's loaded. I know how it works, and I'm good with it, okay? With his, even if I know everything about that weapon, I don't know if it's loaded. I don't know if there's a, if the, weapon, the, the ammo that's in it is in a good firing condition, right? I don't know if the, if the barrel's plugged. I don't know anything, right? He could have just been carrying this thing for intimidation, okay? So I'm betting my life. Now, that's my backup. If I don't have anything, then that's what I have, right? But even with the knife I carry, if I disarm a firearm from somebody, I'm going to back off and pull my clip knife. 
Yeah, but you got a gun. Yeah, but I don't know anything about that gun. And I don't have the time in a life or death kind of situation to figure out if the conditions are right. So I use mine. Okay. So again, just like with any other self-defense technique, you can you can scour YouTube, right? And Vimeo and all these things, right? Looking up all these cool techniques and things. But until you get the tactical and strategic thinking down to know what is important and in what order, nothing else matters. Okay. All right. So, um, so let's jump down to, uh, we did some examples here, right? Guns in your face or somewhere on your body, right? He's, um, he's going for his weapon. I'm sorry. This one is gun in your face. Yeah. Okay. So he's going for his weapon. I need to jam him up so he can't get it into play. And then here I need to take it away from. Him. Okay. All right. So, uh, I keep hinting at this thing because this stuff is so interconnected, right? Most people see martial arts and or self-defense training and the different skill sets like this. Okay? Like tiles stuck up against each other. So like if something's missing, it's no big deal. I got those. I might not even know that's missing, right? But the reality is that this, just like business systems, just like systems you have in your home for your relationships or the way you handle your kids or whatever, right? Everything is interconnected. So these things are more like jigsaw puzzle pieces that go together. Okay? where each one, you get it? Each one plugs in and crosses over and affects the other ones, okay? So let's take a look at how they go together, okay? When I, I'll just start here. When I'm looking at disarms and I learn about disarms, every disarm technique I learn, every tactic and strategy, one, makes me feel good about, you know, my ability to take something away from somebody. But if I'm paying attention... It also makes me go, oh, shit. If I were on the other side, right? And when people tend to train, they tend to think of good guy, bad guy. Good guy's doing the defense. Bad guy's the one attacking, right? Or it's me. I'm always the good guy, right? We take some kind of moral high ground, right? And we forget that a fight's a fight, right? Either one of us could be the bad guy, good guy, whatever. And in most wars, both sides think that they're the, good, they're the good guys and God's on their side. Okay. So it doesn't make you special. Okay. I know people like to believe that, but either way. Okay. So every time I learn how to defend against one of these, or I learn about a certain way that he could come in and attack, and I'm, I'm going to learn to defend against that. Part of me better be going, Oh shit. Can I do the retention part on the other side? When I'm doing retention, I'm not going to rewrite this stuff, right? When I'm doing retention skills and I ask, cool, I can hold on to mine, get my get the muzzle right back on him, shoot him off the thing or get him to back down. I can take it away from his friend and control both of these people, whatever, right? Part of me is going, yeehaw, right? And the other part better be going, oh, shit. Can I counter that kind of retention technique to make sure that, right? So disarms. Those techniques should give us fuel to train retention techniques and retention techniques give us fuel to train disarm techniques. So in the upper levels, upper black belt levels that my guys have, right, we start with each one individually and then a situation turns into the guy who initially is trying to disarm, the other guy is trying to retain, the other guy is going to counter the retention to continue the disarm. You get where we're going with this? Okay. Okay. So what this really boils down to is we have to remember, right? It doesn't matter if we're stuck on shooting skills or we're stuck on our cool techniques and we know some disarms and know some retention or whatever, right? The reality comes down to something that my teacher, Grandma Sahasumi, used to say a lot, right? And probably still does, but he's not writing in those contexts anymore, right? And that is that pride goes before the fall. Wherever you stop or whatever your belief system uh, is for the end of things, right? That's all you need. You create a ceiling, right? We need to go beyond what most people think of as a ceiling to get to here. But as soon as you do that, you just move the ceiling. And so there's a smaller percentage of people that are up here, right? 
But what if you what if you're dealing with somebody like that? You need to be able to go beyond, beyond that one. Okay. So disarms and retention go beyond shooting, but disarms and retention go beyond just knowing one as opposed to the other. Okay. And the other thing I'm going to leave you with is something that another one of my teachers used to say all the time. He was a former Marine, Marine, and we heard, you know, our fair share of cuss words in class if we screwed things up. Okay. And that was really, really simple. Okay. Take this to heart or don't. Train with this or don't. Doesn't matter. Okay. But if you screw this up, your family better look good in black. Okay. All right. So there's the link again. Most of you guys who keep returning, right, you know about this stuff. We have this Friday virtual training. This Friday, we're going to be looking at disarms and retention and jumping into as much of this as possible that we can squeeze into a 75 to 90 minute class. It's an actual virtual class. You're doing your stuff. And even if you're just shadow boxing it, I can at least, you know, look at what you're doing. You can ask questions, all that kind of stuff. It's $4.99. Okay. If that's too much, then just keep doing the whole free YouTube thing and figure it out on your own. I'm sure, you know, given enough time, you'll, you'll figure it out. Right. Um, and uh, what else? I mean, if, if you're, if you want to go beyond that and get like the classes, we have two of these classes a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. I only ever offer the Fridays. Okay. Tuesdays are what my black belts and my advanced people are working on. Uh, so that's, that's a whole other, other thing. Right. But I've got this uh, program called Ninpo Masterclass. Right. So if you get into that, you get both of those classes per week. Also, the recording. So just in case work schedule changes or whatever and you end up missing it, you forget you overslept, whatever. Right. Um, the time that these things are on, uh, you know, it doesn't work for your time zone. That's all fine, too. Right. You get the recording and there's what, thirteen hundred dollars worth of training and programs that are bonuses on top of that right now. Uh, if you jump in before I end up taking that stuff down. So either way. Right. Uh, so again, what we took a look at were disarms and retention. Two of, I think they are the, I mean, while shooting skills has enough things that people overlook, that's an animal in and of itself, right? But retention and disarms is an area that not only go uncovered by most programs, but most people don't even think about the conditions that I laid out, especially those two questions that I asked earlier. And if you miss those, you'll just wait until this live thing is over. And go back and listen to the recording and catch up on all the shit that you missed. All right. So that's what I have for this week. Uh, if Hopefully I'll see you during the Friday masterclass. And if not, no worries. I'll see you next week on our next episode of Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. See you guys.